Well, ladies and gentlemen, on the day two of the World Esports and Gaming Summit, it is now time for our panel discussion on esports investment opportunities get in the game. A rather very intriguing and an interesting topic coming up. We're elated to be joined by our eminent panelists. First up, Bintran, the general partner, 500 startups. We've got Rina Neo, managing director, Ficus. We've got Tobias Bayer the principal blockchain founders fund, and we've got Jasen Osiren, the COO of Semper Fortis. Well, with this, I'd like to heartily welcome all our panelists. And with this, the stage and screen is all yours. Over to you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the conference. We've got an amazing panel uh, coming up, and we're going to be discussing esports and gaming investment opportunities. Today with us, we've got some amazing panelists. We've got Ben Tran, partner of 500 Startups. 500 Startups obviously is a venture capital firm with more than 1.8 billion in AUM that invests in early founders building fast growing technology. Uh, we've got a good friend of mine, Rina Neo, a co-founder and managing director of Ficus Venture Capital. Ficus is uh, the first fully Sharia compliant venture capital company in the world and they help entrepreneurs turn their ideas and visions into successful companies. Tobias Bauer is here from Blockchain Founders Fund, uh, which, is a, which, is a founders, which is a fund, I guess, an early stage investment fund focused on emerging technology projects with real world applications. Um, so let's get this show on the road, shall we guys? Nowadays, you know, Obviously, the, the esports and gaming industry is valued at almost 137.9 billion globally, and that is projected to increase 10% year over year, which is larger than any traditional sports league in the world, NBA, NHL, you name it. Uh, this year, there's about 2.5 billion gamers around the world who will spend around 1.2 billion on gaming and esports alone. This sparks the question, how do investors get in on the booming gaming industry? Um, and that's obviously a massive space. So we'll kind of try to break it down and segment different opportunities throughout the panel. Uh, but before we get started, I'd love to, to you know, hear from each of you. What are some of the factors you're looking at within the gaming or esports sector at the moment? And what excites you the most uh, today? Rena, would, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm sort of not new to the esports world, but uh, back then when I was playing games, those were the arcade games, so Street Fighters. But what I resonate uh, with me about this industry changing is, um, you know, a statement that my mom told me that uh, you keep playing games, you have no future. You're gonna be just uh, a dropout. So, but I still continue. Playing Everyone's games. mother. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I thought, um, so when I had an opportunity to invest in uh, this particular industry, so I'm a seed investor in Bounty, which is a Singapore-based company. Um, well, that's, that's my first and only uh, uh, investment personally. Um, so I, I think it's really um, a very interesting space to be in. I also had the opportunity to uh, really get to know uh, the founder of Mineski Rono, which is a good friend. So they, they are the early players started about wow. seven years ago, um, based out of Philippines. I guess the industry and the way people perceive this industry has changed. Um, people, gamers are now considered athletes. So uh, I think that's a good boost to the people who are in this industry. And recently, I was actually having a panel discussion with um, a group, a new uh, esports group, but they focus on lady gamers, so all the girls gamers. So I think um, there are more people uh, building this ecosystem, which is good. And then I have my fellow panelists here who are you know, heavily invested in it. So I, I'm just a newbie, so I only have one investment in esports, but definitely looking for more opportunities to invest. I, I like the fact that um, in one way or another, it, it actually gives um, those youth and kids who are not interested in academic, but maybe very good in esports to have a chance to build a career, right? So I actually love that angle of it. Yeah, and I think, you know, you touched on it is, is that that layer of community is a very big one in both esports and gaming. And so we'll touch on different layers there, but, you know, right on the dot there. 
Uh, Vin? Yeah, I guess my gaming uh, history or experience goes back. I, I made a PlayStation 1 and Nintendo 64 game. This is way back when, so you guys were probably still in school, but. No, I, I uh, think they, we were all the same. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were all there too. Yes. Remember, this is PlayStation 1, Nintendo 64 cartridges. Um, no, I, I definitely uh, I really enjoyed the gaming industry. I, th I think it's, there's definitely been a huge shift in perspective in the industry. It's no longer someone hardcore in, in their parents' basement playing a game, uh, but there's just new experiences all around, new platforms. Um, the areas, so the world gaming universe has just gone huge. And um, some of the areas that I've focused on, uh, so we're not focused on gaming, but there are certain areas that we think are very innovative. Um, recently invested in an NFT platform for game streamers to be able to go and mint uh, their most exciting parts of the streamers for their community. Uh, feel excited about that one. We invested in a no code gaming development platform. So to allow game developers that don't have coding skills to be able to go and um, basically unleash game creation to, to the masses. Uh, we invested in a uh, video chat um, uh, for mobile games, really building in this experience that isn't quite pure gaming and isn't quite just social, but combining the two, that's, that we thought was really interesting. And then we were the only seed venture capital fund in uh, Axie Infinity, which has uh, really taken off. And I think the play to earn is uh, really challenging business, traditional business, uh, business uh, gaming business models today and showing that there's a, some intersection there with the new new use cases that are very exciting. You know, you hit the you hit the nail on the coffin there. All, all, all of those you know sectors areas have been very heavily touched on in this conference, especially the the NFT blockchain side, because you know you see that marriage of both a blockchain gaming kind of coming into play and that huge boom there. So we'll, we'll jump into that a little bit later on. I'd love to hear from Tobias now, but um, Tobias. Uh, what excites you the most, I guess, in the space? Yeah, um, I definitely agree with a couple of points. Uh, so Ben and Reen, Reen have been mentioning, but for us, it's it's really interesting, right? Because um, now I lived in a couple of emerging markets as well, uh, and you know, a lot of gaming users, especially now in the in the NFT blockchain space, coming from the Philippines, from like emerging markets, essentially, which is recently they actually got access to the whole gaming space, right? I mean, with like cheaper data, with actually sort of getting access to devices in a sense on mobile phones, um, there's a huge wave of like players now entering the market who potentially like 10 years back didn't really have access to the gaming or the gaming space in general, right? Which like, of course, drives the market to a, to a large extent. Um, and I think it's interesting to mention that like ever since, right, since, uh, all players have been sort of investing in their game essentially, right? They bought sort of in-game assets, they bought the swords, they bought their uh, whatever uh, sort of feature to play with, skins, et cetera, and so forth. But the challenge was always that, first of all, you didn't really own anything, right? It was just the digital, it was just digital there. asset. It was just there, exactly. And second of all, only very, very few people were actually making money out of it, right? The gaming in general. It was if you look at all the biggest competitions, that's if you compare it to the actual gamer size, it's almost nothing, right? Who can actually make a living out of gaming or at least um, earn, earn something on the side? And and here for us as blockchain founders fund, where we rest like predominantly in blockchain startups or blockchain based startups, where we look for that use case, right? And about two and a half years ago, uh, we came across Splinterlands and kind of saw that bridge, right? But people now, um, could actually aim, uh, could actually own something, right? And then with this sort of stake to earn mechanism in, the, in these games, people could actually earn money out of it, right? And not just like the top pro player who've been doing this for the last eight hours for the last six years, but actually you and me and like anyone, right? And for some people, it now even exceeds their their income when they're playing games, right? Especially like in emerging markets as well. Um, and about two and a half years ago, no one really like thought about it, right? And and now it has been developed in in such a tremendous space where like uh been said Axie Infinity is obviously a very predominant player in our splinterlands also according to uh, depth radar 
uh, one of the biggest blockchain games in the world um, and like growing tremendously, like growth rates we probably haven't seen in, in other industries from a user perspective, um, if, if you sort of put it right in, in perspective. And, and, and to you guys, quick, yeah. just not to cut you off, uh, Tobias, but is, is that part because of the pandemic? And I, I mean, looking at what Axie Infinity did uh, in markets like the Philippines, for example, massive, yeah. massive growth. In, in, and I think they're the number one community that plays Axie. Is it because of, you know, the, the restrictions in Asia and kind of what happened to small businesses that, um, you know, small business owners didn't have another option other than to perhaps find a gaming scenario where they're able to generate income? Uh, yeah, I, well, I guess I could talk a little bit. Philippines represents about 40% of the gaming audience. So it's actually spread out a little bit more, 6% in, in the U.S. And absolutely, the gaming industry was growing prior to COVID. COVID just really accelerated it, right? People just needing to be online, being these virtual worlds and you know, for, for some folks in developing countries, how, how am I going to make a living, right? You know, what are my options? And so being able to address that is, um, is really exciting to see. At the same time, bringing on a new type of not just uh, gamer, but uh, crypto user, you know, it's not that easy to get on to Axie, right? They have 2 million, uh, close to 2 million daily actives, and it's not easy to get on. It's fun to play, but it's definitely not easy. So you imagine like what is still very early in the journey there of combining. The, the, for me, blockchain was always the combination of different stakeholders, the creators, the community, the investors, the marketing. And with NFTs, it just aligns it so much cleanly. Um, and I guess from my, I guess gaming, just because it's in a digital medium, this lends itself to be just a natural uh, use case for what's what's happening with this combination of different stakeholders. Yeah, I mean, though, definitely, that's it's it's been a massive, massive change, and I think in a lot of communities. And I would just to add on that, Ben, it's it's also kind of supporting your community and making sure that you're able to maintain growth within the platform, and that's what they've been doing uh, tremendously well. Um, I'd also, you know, just to add on your point is, you know, you're bringing a massive amount of users into the crypto economy, which is, you know, it's great for, for crypto and blockchain. And, and I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just the beginning uh, for such a space. Uh, Rena, this, this one's specifically for you, and we'll just st stick to the crypto blockchain topic for now. But um, from an investor's perspective, what are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the downsides to tokenized infrastructures in gaming? So if someone would, would, would come to you and say, look, th you know, this is what I'm looking at doing. And, and obviously there's a crypto element or there's a blockchain element. Are there any downsides to that from an investor's perspective? And what would those be? I guess, um, you know, based on my experience in uh, Bounty, they first did an ICO. Uh, you know, before they actually raise. So for me, um, not an expert in, in crypto or blockchain, but I do see uh, the utility part of it. Firstly, I think uh, in a gaming world, people are definitely the gamers are more tech. Therefore, you know, using uh, the token uh, will be so much easier compared to the other um, industry. So I, I think this is a good thing because like, for example, block, uh, Bounty itself, right? Um, Basically, the platform is focusing on uh, probably the social gamers. So the, the motto is, you know, you get paid to play. So it's any social gamers. You don't have to be the hardcore. That's where we are looking at. And uh, basically, the platform allows any, um, anyone to be a tournament organizers. But I think one of the um, so-called challenges that was shared by the founder, Lax, who were many years ago, uh, one of the top gamers, um, is that their prize money is, you know, they, they have a hard time with drawing the prize money. Even Rono was saying that, you know, tournament organizers basically run away with their prize money. So I think uh, with blockchain and, and, you know, tokenization, this could ensure that, you know, um, players get paid, uh, you know, when it's due. So I think uh, this is going to be a, a game changer for this. Yeah. 
uh, any, any of you, Ben or Tobias, want to add on to, to those as, as from an investment angle? Are there any pitfalls that, that you would look out for um, and ones that you would kind of recommend to, to founders to, to, to tighten up before obviously looking for a round? Yeah, um, there are a couple of things here. Um, I think two, two main points I want to mention. So the first one is obviously when, when you bring in investors in the round, right? Um, and it, we typically like prefer a private sale over a public sale just because of regulatory challenges, but also because we want to use um, like people in the space to invest in the token, right? And then eventually like as of sort of key opinion leaders or influence help drive the user base rather than just listing in on an exchange essentially, right? Because um, like it's, it's, a, it's a big thing, right? If any mocha, like all these players like invest in the token and they share them in social media, that's obviously has a tremendous impact on the community as well and driving users right towards your game. Um, so that's how we've sort of structured in that way that we bring in like these key people who sort of drive the community from an investment perspective, which is probably a bit different than if you think of traditional VC investments in, in other companies. And on the other side, from an investor perspective, I think it's still very, very crucial that you don't get um, that you don't overlook the gaming part in in the blockchain and crypto space, right? Because the game has to be still amazing, like and people want to love and want to love to play it. And um, you know, because what I feel like we get a lot of gaming companies reaching out to us, and obviously yeah, all of them use uh, the, the crypto angle um, to to build their community and sort of drive drive all of that. Um, but a lot of these games are just not designed by gamers, right? And like by passionate gamers, right? And you see that what you see with like X Infinity, like Splinterlands, these guys, the founders, they're like gamers by heart, you know, like they love what they're doing. And that's why they build something where people actually want to play. Because I think that only the crypto angle alone probably won't cut it, at least not in the long term, right? You won't probably have like a short term explosion or maybe not even, but then in the long term, it's going to be very hard to sustain a game. And that has, of course, tremendous, um, influence on the token but also on the investment for both investors but also for the in-game right and i think that's something uh where investors just just like they still need to have the business lens on when they look at these games i think that's like uh, in my opinion a big big a very important factor i think that's easy to see is kind of seeing past you know just the token yeah. element and what you know i guess whether you're a gamer or you're just a blockchain fanatic trying to merge the two it really it's it's not easy but there is a formula for kind of combining the both yeah. um, and, and you got to get it right, I think. So, so, you know, for it to make sense. And it, I think from a community perspective and from an investment perspective, um, one can see right through the agenda really. So um, Br yeah. uh, Ben, anything to add on, on that as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's really hyped right now, you know? So if you're coming in, you're missing the initial coin offering and it's half a billion dollars and it's based on some artwork. Um, you got to start looking at some fundamentals, right? I think it's more than just forking an open source project and slapping some graphics on there. Uh, really understanding how the team's aligned, how much they've thought about. A lot of these projects, are, they have, they're like the mini Federal Reserve. They have to really figure out how to align investors with folks who who play and is it easy for, for folks to come in and how they're funding it, the treasury. So there's a lot of deep thinking around inflation, hyperinflation, people who pump and dump. So buyer beware during this time. Um, NFTs seem like the new ICOs. Um, at the same time, you know, there's projects out there that are really terrible at, uh, when you look at it from an ESG perspective, you know. Uh, these these drops are happening are, are you know, hugely wasteful for for the environment. So one thing you really has to be addressed long term is that uh, you know, the gas fees for for a lot of these different things. Um, and if you align it right and you get a community who trusts that you know you've got a lot of like social positive things happening for the community. That trust goes a huge long way. It's not just, hey, I, I want my token to go up, but there's something else here for me. You know, um, that's kind of hard to unlock. And if you get that right, then then that's kind of your differentiator. I mean, just like just like the the ICO days, it's it's easy to to build hype, right? And everybody knows how to market something these days. It seems, especially with the with the NFT markets. 
Um, but you're right. I mean, the tokenomic structure, everything to do with the actual economics of your project is is really where an investor should be looking at. And I think, um, you, you know, you hit the nail on the coffin there. Um, before we just we move on, are there any other, I'd say, areas or winning combinations um, within blockchain and tokenized structures that you think can work within a gaming aspect other than just um, you know the in-game, uh, I guess, in-game assets and 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 earning and earning in-game. What else do you think are some winning combinations that blockchain can can essentially help or enhance the gaming field? I, I can share a little bit. Uh, so the media aspects of not everyone plays. People love to watch games, and that's just a huge, huge. I mean, it's bigger than sports themselves. So being able to tap into that dynamic between someone who is playing, they're not maybe even not famous, but they're just entertaining to watch, right? And they have a huge audience who just wants to be entertained. So being able to monetize the audience and reward that creator for that media, right? And that there's not a lot of IP there. It's just, you know, it's user-generated content and it's rabid and it's everywhere in every language. That's so that's a huge, huge market. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities there kind of flattening the whole structure around marketing and, you know, licensing or, or uh, advertisers. So um, it's, 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 yeah. I think to add on there, it's like the, the creator economy that's that's upon us, that's been, you know, surged by Twitch and others are also huge to look at. And I think, um, you know, within that viewership kind of uh, chemistry and relationship with, uh, you know, fans and teams, there's a massive uh, opportunity there for fan tokens and things of that nature that have more trust than, you know, just, I guess, projects that are being put out there. Um, yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Just want to add on quickly because, um, for me, it's always looking at that perspective that, um, you built that that stickiness, right? Both from a community perspective, but also from a player perspective, and and I feel like with with the NFT space, I mean, so many people watch these live streams on YouTube, on Twitch, and all these, um, but there hasn't been a way to engage with them properly, right? Um, and as well from a gamer, like I was game myself but I never, never felt like I'm, I'm sort of part of the game right and now playing these ft based games um especially when it gets easier and easier to access them for for also non-crypto people I, I really feel like i'm sort of part of that structure right i'm part of that game and that really increases like that i stick with that game and not just switch to another one right because it's coming out or something else. so like um that, that's sort of what's what's a big thing for me and it's both for the fan base of of a streamer but also from the actual player who stand registered within the game and driving the user growth internally exactly it, it excites the user it excites the end user and i think that's what keeps you a part of the community right do you remember the game to... flappy bird you know you used to have these like mobile games that would come in be top yeah, yeah. charts and then next month it'll be another game and then no one would want to invest in games because uh, you know oh it's a one-hit wonder what happened is that these games started becoming data machines they started crunching uh, how to optimize that retention and how to capture and, and and use that data to be able to create more engaging personalized experiences and these games started having longevity you know extended out three five years people used to think oh candy crush no, Candy Crush is going to be around when, when for another 10 years, right? So they, these data engineering and science co companies are, are, um, are, they're not gaming companies, they're data and engineering companies. And um, what's exciting to see is that a lot of the franchises, it's huge games coming from, uh, you know, Activision, or there's only a few titles, but they're really long lived. Their number one problem is retention. And well, and second is probably um, customer acquisition. So what a amazing paradigm shift happening with play to earn where you're essentially solving it. You know, the D30 um, retention rates for Axies are five times the mobile industry average. That's it. And so, and, and all these game publishers, you know, they're, it takes a lot of effort to build an amazing in-game experience you know, they are 
haven't gone on. So we're still in the very early innings of like these massive, amazing gaming talent creators coming on and doing this play to earn. So it's going to be really exciting to be able to see, uh, I think, a fundamental shift in, in gaming. If, if only Flappy Bird had an in-game crypto bin, I tell you, things would have been different. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on, I think we'll just one more in, in this sector, but we, everybody in this conference has been going on about the metaverse. And I think this is a very exciting topic for everyone. The way I see it, obviously, is, you know, the metaverse is kind of an area where you're connecting all kinds of, you know, different pillars, whether it's gaming, AI, crypto, kind of all in one realm. Um, what do you guys see within the space of, of the metaverse and what kind of opportunities are you looking at there? Um, anything that you see um, can essentially be the evolution of gaming, esports, um, crypto? Rena, we'll start with you. Yes, I, I think it's, it's definitely, you know, um... Even business and moving into immersive and digital world. I think um, there is a company that I was looking at uh, in Singapore. Basically, uh, they they develop um, devices where they were showing me like you know I can do a kickboxing with someone else in in another another location. So I think um, it has to be integrated. So definitely, you know, this is a, a space where um, it is in, while we are building the community. Um, it is a space that I think um, it will definitely create more content rather than just, you know, someone sitting behind a screen playing, right? Um, we want to bring this, I guess gaming, it, it could be um, the sports as well. It's not just esports. So I definitely look into um, this part of it. But of course, in Asia, we don't find uh, that many of such companies yet. I'm looking at one or two actually from um, Turkey. Fantastic. I mean, Turkey is a massive, massive, uh, you know, esports industry, and, and it's it's only growing. The user base in Turkey is, you know, nothing beats that. Well, you know, one of the biggest, fastest growing, and young populations, big, yeah. big uh, gamers as well. And anyone else just want to touch on that metaverse uh, topic? Yeah guys see is that the evolution is that what's taking place and from an investment angle i'd love to hear tobias as well what are you seeing what are you looking at yeah we so we we, we like to um look at companies who makes who make the metaverse essentially more real and more personal right uh, i think that's going to be key moving forward um to to create that almost like real life feeling in the metaverse and we, we invested actually in a very, very cool company uh, and they basically allow you to have your best friend, right? Uh, by your side in your adventures in the digital world. So you basically own a dog within, with having like unique NFT <laughs> sort of train it, right? You train it, interact it. It has an um, AR component to it and you compete with a dog essentially in play to earn games, right? Uh, and and with Nintendo, so what I was with the Nintendo DS, uh, like you know, people went all really crazy, and it, and there's so much collaboration with brands out there, where you can potentially like, not not just like have your NFT, but like, live with it, work with it, train it, love with it, you know, like and and have like that real friend sort of in the metaverse, which makes it like much more personal and and so sort of like, admirable to be in, right? Which gives you like, to an extent, um things people looking outside the metaverse bring it into metaverse right because it's something else if you hold a card which appreciates the value, value but if you have your own nft essentially you can like you know become friends with in a sense and you have like all these other other technology aspects like ar to an extent on top of it um which makes it even more um you know sort of uh, feasible in a sense um, i think that's sort of uh, moving forward where there'll be a lot of cool opportunities from an investor perspective as well but also from for player and for a community. That that reminds me, uh, Tobias, of the Tamagotchi back in the 90s. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> Where everybody used to have their digital animal or pet. And today, you know, it's just on an open source platform that everyone can kind of train and, and compete with everyone else's pets. And I think that's just fantastic. And 
if you know if Tamagotchi made it, I think you know something like Zed Run, which is also you know been a huge yeah. success. It's it's a no brainer. Uh, ben, exactly. Yeah, I, I really don't still understand metaverse, but <laughs> there's a couple of metaverse things that I've been uh, exposed to that I thought was maybe metaverse-y. Um, I, I, so someone's working on uh, something for retailers. You know, if you're you know, selling 10,000 limited editions of Nike Air Force Ones, you know, it comes with an NFT that can, that there's scarcity there in, in, in the digital world. They could represent that. Um, but they also have the real world shoe there. And so it's it's be able to authenticate that the one of the ten thousand whatever, um, uh, and, and without beating it to a dead horse, you know, Axie Infinity's SLP with, with sufficient um, adoption. There's certain cities in, in the Philippines where you know some of the retailers are accepting L, N, SLP, right? And and they go and change that on uh, the bridge that Axie built called Ronin, and they can change without fees. So people are selling their motorbikes for SLP or sandwich for SLP and, and it's happening in offline. Um, and then obviously those, those, those uh, cryptos uh, in the Axie world, along with the land and uh, unacity that's being sold and still kind of undefined on what could be built there and, and what is going to happen. So um, yeah, so much in flux. I, I think, you know, a huge thing in the metaverse side of things is kind of the crossing. And from an investment angle, I think we're going to see a lot of this is that crossing emergence from the, from the physical to the digital, right? So if you sell shoes, why not sell them, you know, in the metaverse essentially, and then you can sell two pairs rather than one. So I think it's, it's a massive, massive opportunity. Um, and it's, it's really hitting hard with traditional industries today. So, you know, real estate, like Tobias was mentioning, is, is a big one. And, uh, and I think it's, it's a huge uh, investment angle that's only growing. We're still at the, you know, we're still at the, at the forefront. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, just to move on to, you know, just a little bit outside of the blockchain crypto space, I wanted to get into the community side of things. Obviously, in gaming and, and, and esports, communities are extremely massive. Look at Twitch, and obviously Amazon bought Twitch for $970 million, which I think was the, the biggest deal of the, the century. Um, we have groups of companies coming together to allow people to connect, communicate with like-minded gamers. Um, look at Discord, for example. Discord was a massive, massive deal as well. I think their, their valuation is about $15 billion today, which is, you know... It, which is crazy. Um, what, I'll, ben, I'll start with you. What is it about community platforms that really triggers investors to jump in? Is it the data that, that, that you know, are, are, are put together? Is it the access to the end user? Is it the revenue model? I'm sure you've heard of gaming as a service. What would you look at? You know, what's the biggest, I guess, attention seeker there? There's... Um massively uh, valuable company roblox right 40 billion dollars and they have a massive community and uh, what that community does for roblox is um, retention and acquisition right it's just they don't need to, to 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 keep coming out with content and keep coming out with ways to be able to engage their players community does that for them and um there's network effects with you know how the community is growing to be able to get you know, your child on there with their, their, their classmates to be able to enjoy the, the Roblox world. So um, I think community, uh, it just really makes the property, the asset, um, adds a longevity to the asset. Um, and clearly from the numbers, they're just throwing off massive cash. Worlds within worlds within worlds in, in Roblox, I tell you, it's mind blowing. So uh, you know, kids today, they're, it's madness, madness. Rena, one for you is, I know you're a big fan of user acquisition, especially with, you know, e-commerce and traditional platforms. What are some of the factors you would look at in, in the gaming sector? What kind of IP excites you in community-specific platforms? Well, I've always been interested in, in 
not just the gaming, but I think um, the science and the art behind it. Like, you know, how do you design something that people want to play? Because I think, you know, for all the social media platforms that we have, I think fundamentally uh, for the founding team is really to understand human psychology. So I'll probably, you know, take um, Bounty, for example, uh, why I decided to invest in it. Because in Philippines, I invested in a, in a company that basically brings Wi-Fi to the uh, slums community. And uh, that's a social project. But when we uh, do a deeper dive on um, you know, why we should provide uh, Wi-Fi to these uh, slums in community, we actually sample uh, adults and we sample uh, teens. Uh, they're basically just drop off from schools or they don't have access to schools. But the funny thing about, um, for example, Philippines or Indonesia, so everyone has a phone. They may not have data, but all of them have like two phones, which is like, you know, I only have one phone. I'm sure they can't live without them either. <laughs> exactly. So um, since we provide um, data to them, like maybe 30 minutes every day, right? So we, we basically ask them, we ask the kids, you know, why do you want data, extra data for? For the adults, it's basically, you know, they look for jobs, they want to call their yeah, family members overseas. But for the kids um, between like 10 to 16, we ask them, why do you want extra data for? is basically playing games. Mm -hmm. So I think from Bounty's perspective and, and my person, uh, you know, um, I would say outlook is that in the esports industry, I think uh, one of the, the key thing is basically how do we um, probably um, get talent? How do we get, how do we know someone plays you know, a game good? Because it's just like, you know, I've played games since I was young, but how do we know I'm good, right? So when Bounty first started, why we created the platform was basically imagine um, it is a LinkedIn for gamers that you can basically tell people that you have a, you have a, a record or a CV of you know how many games you've played and all this. So I thought um, since I you know I'm very passionate about education, it doesn't mean that it has to be the formal education. So I thought you know when I invest in Bounty, this these two big companies basically have some synergy. I wanted Bounty to be able to work with them uh, to basically give opportunities to these kids that we can track them early, that they have got a talent because it's not like modeling that you can walk on the street and, and the talent manager get to look at you mm -hmm. and these kids don't have a chance, right? So if they don't have chance and opportunity to, um, to go to school or be an academic, maybe we can help them since they already have an interest, right? So that, that was what, you know, I really like about this um, industry. It basically is a community close-knitted. Like my brothers and I play game and we've been on the same game with the community from around the world for like five, six years. So I think that is the part that I really like about this industry. I think simpl simplicity. Simplicity in, in, in gamification is, is massive. And, and, you know, everybody loves the game, so... You, it's you know it's easy to find communities everywhere it's kind of just like you know we've been hitting the nail on the coffin many times uh, but to, to keep them engaged and and you know the ev evolution of your platform um i'll start with you tobias but this is for all of you guys how can investors verify true communities now a lot of platforms can come to you and say listen i've got a you know ton of user data um, on my platform, we've got this much, uh, you know, daily usership, and we're looking to raise. Um, we all know it's easy to buy a community today, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're engaged. So, from an investment angle, what can you do to kind of verify a true community versus a manipulated one? Yeah, I think it's a good question uh, because a lot of I mean, a, a big or a lot of members of a community doesn't necessarily mean it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the right community, right? Because exactly. people could sign up but not really be active, right? Or people could could sign up and active but don't don't interact and don't engage. It right? basically also doesn't add a lot of value. So I'd rather have a smaller community where people interact with each other, where there's a lot of shared content, where there's content actually produced within their community, right? Because I think obviously, yeah, like the company in itself has to share content within the community or like the key players within the community. But if the community essentially creates its own content, that's where the value has been created within the community, right? Because that that's what kind of like 
um, gives you or like uh, leads to you staying within the community and engaging in the community, right? There's a similar to what network effects and what all these social media platforms essentially made so big because if no one would have down, if everyone would have, if a hundred million people would have downloaded that, but no one would actually produce content on it, they probably, it wouldn't work, right? Um, so I think that's key to, to figure out, okay, obviously you can look at some KPIs of like user retention, how many of, how many are active, like, you know, how much data is, is stored in the content every once in a while. But I think it's also like just experience by yourself, right? Um, I think a lot of investors, that's the thing also as a challenge is, um, they, they invest in something, but they've never really actually played it, right? Mm -hmm. Or took exactly. taking part in it, right? So, exactly. I mean, I, I talked to a lot of investors like, oh, have you downloaded the app or the, the game and actually played it for like two days, you know, like for a weekend. But it's, it's surprisingly how many say actually no, right? And, and I think, uh, you know, numbers and everything is one thing, but in gaming, it's so much more on the emotional side. It's so much more on like how addictive is something and how, how, how many people get driven into it. And if you don't experience by yourself, it's just hard to make a judgment on it, right? If you don't become part of like, obviously you have a job, I get that. You don't need to do it eight hours a day, but like, <laughs> you know, at least download it and, and do it and engage with it and sort of see for yourself how the community builds on it. And I think that's just something which I, I think uh, everybody should do before considering investing in a, in a space or even um, making any judgment about the community is actually join the community, right? join a Discord channel or like, you know, play the game and like do all these things a normal gamer would do to get an idea um, and a sense of how the community is structured, how it's built, how active is it, because then it's also hard to fool, fool you, right? Um, Absolutely. Or give you numbers you couldn't trust. Absolutely. I, th I think, look, I mean, it's a shame uh, how many tickets have gone out to manipulated companies because, you know, investors just don't bother looking at real uh, usership versus the value of the users that are on the platform. And today it's just, it's just funny. We value numbers more than the actual figures. And in my opinion, mm -hmm. it's kind of the value of a more engaged community rather than a, you know, wholesome community is a lot more, uh, you know, it's a lot more valuable to me in terms of an investment. Uh, ben, anything you want to touch on that? Yeah, sometimes you don't even have that, right? All you have is a white paper and people are pouring money in. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, I guess if you're looking to invest in a, in a kids game, you know, if you have any kids, have them play it. Um, I know I'm I'm itching after this call to collect my 25 SL Smooth Love Potion Daily Quest. Awesome. Um, but uh, when we talked to Axie back in 2018, they had less than 400 Axies at the time, and um, what they did have was this video, like you mentioned, Tobias, music video, community made about Axies. So there was something special there, right? Yeah, so exactly. that was a pretty, pretty clear indicator that they had rabid fans, small, but rabid fans are super engaged. And um, yeah, one, look for the one view, things. one view, but hundreds of videos. That's 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 the power, right? Rather than 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 just the big numbers. Exactly, it's super engaged. Um, well, look, I'm going to transition over to our last segment, which is investing in esports specifically. Um, there are many well known gaming organizations today. I'm sure you've all heard of FaZe Clan, 100 Thieves, G2, Semper Esports. Uh, some of these organizations are valued at 200 million plus. Like sports franchises, uh, these teams operate multiple professionally managed teams, they play a number of games. Teams compete in tournaments. They win millions of dollars in prize money. However, the big revenue generators are sponsorship and media rights. What are your thoughts about the comparison of, of the sports, traditional sports industry to the rising esports industry around the globe? And what would you look at when, when kind of looking at a team uh, that, that's a gaming team or a gaming organization versus uh, you know, a, ho a hockey or football team? Toby? Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting thought um, because the, I think the challenge for me always in, in, in esports was if you compare it to traditional sports, right? I mean, soccer, football, for example, right? Uh, I'm from Germany, FC Bayern Munich is obviously something which has been always sort of uh, dragging around. Um, and like the fans were sort of able to to go to a stadium right they can show how they love their fans and they can like really be part of it in a sense and 
you have all these fan articles you can buy, you can run around with your shirt uh, and you show the world that you're, you know, a big believer in that team and everything. And that, that was at least, you know, previously that was so challenging to, to replicate in the digital world, mm -hmm. right? Because obviously, yeah, you could play your favorite game and be a player. Fair enough. That's probably cool, but you don't still have that sort of, um, sort of engagement, right? I mean, if you look at the arena, it's just digital people there. I mean, they, they, they say something. It's a, it's a very different vibe playing esports than it is for uh, like real sports. Obviously, COVID changed also real sports quite a bit. So that obviously shifted quite a bit, which makes it now even more challenging for, for fans and get, uh, engage with, with, uh, with, with their, their idols and with their team. Um, and I think that's sort of where, where I think it's so, it's so interesting. You can layer potentially so many so many options, so many possibilities on top of that simple e-game that you actually create um, with a, you know, argumented reality, for example, right? You could just potentially be sitting in a stadium and actually playing in a stadium, right? That's that's cool. Or with NFTs, you could potentially, um, you know, bring that fan and, and, and you know, sort of team sport um, connection better into into the metaverse um, or into real life essentially as well. And, and I think that's sort of where, where the shift needs to happen. So I'm a big believer in that space of, um, you know, figuring out how to layer different services on top of the community you have and how do you be way more engaged from the community perspective to create that real life sportiness at home, right? Or from your smartphone, wherever you start playing it. And, and I think if there is a company doing, working on that angle, I think it could be very, very powerful. I think what's interesting is just the impact of games in general and the impact mm. of gas these days is that a lot of players are kind of addicted to, to different games are, and are now learning from viewership, right? So yeah. whether you're watching or Twitch and in esports, you can definitely go to, to, to a stadium and watch your favorite team. The, the League of Legends World Championships has more viewership than than the NBA finals, which is absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's huge and it's only so you see how much potential there is, right? Absolutely. Exactly. And so there's so much potential there, um, that, uh, you know, I, I, the way that I see the, the new generation coming up, um, you know, games are starting to just take over the traditional side of things. Um, Ben, anything you want to touch on, on, on the kind of the similarities between the two or, uh, what would you look at specifically if a team were to come to you um, for a raise and what, what are the aspects that, you know, uh, that you would look at that can, that would allow you to make a judgment then? Yeah. So I'm, I'm friends with Jonathan Wendell, the godfather of esports. You know, he, I w we went on vacation once and he, uh, he's middle of the day. He said, I'll, I'll see you later. I said, where are you going? I gotta go practice, you know, and he had, he had to go and, just put in his hours to be able to be on top of his game. And um, as you know, there's, there's a small window where you can be at that level. Oh yeah. And so it's super competitive. Everyone, you know, so I, I question like the longevity of being able to, um, I don't know, find a franchise and that's going to produce the returns. Um, I'm not deep in that space. So, uh, you know, people can probably, me wrong but for me uh the esports opportunity there's definitely on the competitive side and team-based investment but it's also just a brand new media that is attracting a lot of eyeballs you know i find myself sometimes on a on a platform and cruise by someone playing a game it's i'll be and all of a sudden 15 minutes goes by and i just you know got, got lost in that, in that in that gameplay true uh, I mean, so, I'll tell you. I'll yeah. tell you one thing, Ben, is is that professional gamers are just extraordinarily extraordinary athletes, and that's how we started this conversation. They're, they're it's you can't compare to just a you know a, a normal gamer on Twitch, and so you're watching extraordinary talent. Um, I th I think that you know just esports is it, it's it's growing very very quickly because of the games that are slowly becoming. Uh, esports themselves due to the, the regulations of their developers and very very soon I see you know uh, the face clans of the world can very much compare to the Manchester United's of the world because the communities are there and it's you know they're they're growing into more games now when you look at Manchester United they play football but when you look at a face clan for example they play a number of games 
which means you're open to a number of different audiences and, and ages as well. So I think there's a huge value there. Um, Rina, any, anything you, you want to touch uh, on that side as well? I'm sure. I think, you know, I'm looking at, um, because I also invest in brands, you know, um, direct to consumer brands. I'm seeing a lot of um, the advertising and sponsorships, uh, you know, that, that particular budget that you have, right? Placing it on, on uh, these esports is actually growing. Like it's been growing since, you know, um, the last 10 years. For me, I think, you know, um, esports and the traditional sports, for example, like football, um, we talk about how to basically, you know, combine um, esports into the metaverse where you can feel the action. Because I think now looking at esports, you're basically looking at the, the player playing on a virtual world. So the guy's just sitting, but I think footballs and, and live uh, traditional games is basically you're seeing the player in action. I mean, the five senses, you know, the, the guy kicking the ball and all this, right? That, that gives a different kind of uh, feeling for me. For example, I, I play tennis, right? I mean, I could look at, you know, probably a, a, um, a virtual tennis game versus looking live. So I think there are, if, if esports or all the games, um, can be more real, I think, yeah. But definitely, you know, it is, um, I would say there is no ceiling for eSports. Like you said, multi-channels, multi-layers, right? Uh, it can reach so so much more people, right? So I, I think um, definitely I'm not, not um, so experienced in investing the team itself, but I do see that, um, some of my friends who basically built teams uh, is, is a lot of hard work, like longevity of the team, uh, whether they can actually um, you know, give that return. So yeah, definitely love to learn more uh, from yourself and Kevin. De definitely. Guess, because, uh, you know, uh, into team, you know. Uh, I, I, think, I think it's also kind of the commercial evolution of teams and how they, you know, look to diverse you know, further than just sponsorship and media rights. That's pretty, pretty important to, to the investment side of things. Um, to, to just on the back of that, you know, in order to, for the industry to mature to a stage where you see multiple titles uh, thriving commercially, what in your opinion will be the driver for future growth? Uh, media rights with uh, large partnerships, you know, you see a lot of uh, crypto partnerships today, infrastructure uh, development, you know, what's the biggest driver there? Ben, do you want to take that one? I mean, we're in games, so the biggest driver is fun. And I think games <laughs> in general, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> the biggest driver is being fun. Just but have fun, really like, Exactly. There's certain things about, like, uh, reaching consumers that are just universal uh, with, with media. So K-pop is pretty universal, right? And um, some music is universal. But games truly does cross cultural language barriers. And so the, that pie is just getting huge, both on, you know, obviously developed countries as un, uh, developing countries as well as developed countries and, and across the spectrum on different, all sorts of different platforms. So only half, you know, the, the world is, is actually connected. And, and so there's still tons of room to grow as, as, in terms of just the gaming universe. So that's exciting to, to realize. And I think the key there is just, you know, create a fun game. Have fun, have fun creating it. T Toby, what do you think is, is the biggest driver to, 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 for the future growth of, of esports commercially? How can I mean, they diversify? Yeah, I mean, definitely fun, right? But also I think, uh, simplicity and I'm not meaning that a game should be easy <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about <laughs> otherwise it probably wouldn't be fun but I mean like um from a whole access point of view right and from a whole engagement point of view like it needs to be if you want to bring on masses on games uh it needs to be simple user user interfaces need to be simple um how to get registered uh, on, on these on these games needs to be simple of course you have any crypto blockchain angle it needs to be simple it's still right now too complicated um for for a lot of people um, but then, of course, also, um, 
you know, building building a community and monetizing that community and finding different ways of monetizing it. And then probably like at some point in time, I I would even like take a guess and say, maybe the biggest media and uh, entertainment platforms essentially are going to be overtaken by community and individual people itself, right? Because they have so much more uh, potential to be engaged and be connected that you don't need these bigger guys anymore because a community could maybe potentially sustain on their own, right? Um, so I think from a community perspective, there needs to be much more done. There needs to be much more focused from an investor perspective. Um, it needs to be much more, you know, you need to find ways of monetizing it essentially way better than you do it right now. Uh, but not like to a bad extent, but just to, with the idea of bringing these parties closer together and, and cutting out all these middlemen and essentially just making a very smooth and simple and fun way of gaming. Very true. And and I'd love to see kind of marriages into different industries as well that just allow you to connect to different audiences and, uh, you know, and scopes of people. Um, guys, it was a great panel. And I think we're way over time, but I'd love to round it off here um, and just get a quick last one liner from each of you. Um, how would you support founders or, or give us a one liner just for support and the entrepreneurs out there? What is your advice to those looking for funding in, in the gaming industry? Maybe I could start first. I, I yeah. guess you know, any founders looking for funding, uh, the best way to really get your funding is when you donate it because then you have more leverage. Um, and I, I think um, I would also love to see um, you know, how, how can we basically come together and, and uh, make sure that this ecosystem uh, thrive, right? So taking, for example, like uh, Adobe, it is for designers to make beautiful designs, but Canva make everyone a designer, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if someone will come and say, okay, you know, Rina, you don't have coding, you have absolutely, you know, no experience, but you can create games, simple games, you know, that, that, have, that can get people playing. I think that that's a good start. Because it seems like it is, a, you know, um, probably a, a too technical industry to, to get in, right? So I'd love to see someone basically uh, do a Wix kind of thing, right? You know, you, you don't need to know programming, but you can create simple games, right? So um, that, that's all for me. Sim simplicity at its finest. Yeah. Absolutely. Ben? Um, I guess there's a pretty good selection of gaming-focused funds these days. And so I think founders have a lot of options to choose from, uh, really depending on uh, if they're going out to fundraising at really early stage, just focusing on the, on the storytelling, making sure that you are capturing that story in a way that just resonates with the, with, with the fund and obviously qualify the fund. Just make sure that who you're talking to is investing in that stage, investing that on that type of platform and where you're headed. So, um, you know, qualify on both sides someone that understands you. Yeah, actually it is true. Yeah. I mean, most of the, the people on the cap table for Bounty, we are like gamers. So you don't exactly. have to explain exactly. to us, you know. It's a match, it's a match. Yeah, yeah, we, we understood, we feel it, right? So it's an easier sell. Exactly. Tobias? Yeah, my last comment would just be, um, like don't, don't build a game to raise funding. <laughs> I mean, build a game to, to actually bring users and, and because you believe in, in what you're building and you can bring joy to that community you're trying to do. And then I think if you do all this, um, the funding will come from alone because you're just building something people want to, you know, play with and then essentially invest in. And I feel like just building to, to get that exit or get that the next level. Um, I, I don't think any successful game has been built that way. Like, I think like all these gamers, they just, love what they do and like they build crazy and they that's what they love and then essentially they build something people actually want to play and it goes back to Vin's point right of like having fun and building something which lasts and is fun and then I think investors will also understand if they download the game and then they, they'll potentially um, you know help you sort of fund their growth. I think we, we can all agree it's a super fun industry and it's it's only going up from here. I uh, thank you all for for joining me it was a really rock star. Thank you rock star thank panel you. and I'm looking forward to, to catching up with you, you guys on the back end. Uh, take care, everyone. Thank you guys for your time. Thank, thank you, you so much. All. It was a pleasure. What an incredible panel discussion it was on esports investment opportunities. Get in the game.